Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Tonight we are honored to have Dr. Michael Espy presenting R01 and R21 Grantsmanship. My name is Janelle Slade and I will be hosting tonight's webinar. This webinar will be approximately 30 minutes followed by a question and answer session. Please enter any questions you may have in the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of tonight's presentation. If you would like to turn on closed captioning, you can do so by simply clicking the show captions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Registrants can expect to receive a recording of this presentation as well as a copy of the slide deck within five to seven days via email. Now, before I introduce tonight's moderator, I would like to briefly mention, uh, please be on watch for the open registration announcement for the 17th International Congress for Radiation Research. This event is set for August 27th through the 30th of 2023 in Montreal, Quebec. We will hold just one worldwide 2023 meeting this year. So we hope you can join RRS as we come together with our scientific colleagues from around the world in North America's number one host city for international events. Moderating for us this evening is RRS President, Dr. Julie Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is a tenured professor in radiation oncology at Washington University School of Medicine. After completing her undergraduate degree at Duke University, Dr. Schwartz completed her medical degree and PhD as part of the Medical Scientist Training Program at Washington University School of Medicine in 2004. She joined the faculty in 2009 after completing residency in radiation oncology at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Currently, Dr. Schwartz serves as Vice Chair for Research and Director of Cancer Biology Division in the Department of Radiation Oncology. Dr. Schwartz has held numerous leadership roles in professional organizations and is the current president of the Radiation Research Society. Her areas of research interest include gynecology, oncology, tumor metabolism, tumor immunity, molecular imaging, and biomarker development. Dr. Schwartz is an R01 funded investigator. Her laboratory research includes using human tumor specimens to study the biologic pathways that regulate cancer treatment response. Now, these studies have employed a gene expression and genomic analyses. Most recently, she has identified mutations in PIK3CA and P10 that are associated with tumor redox metabolism and the response to radiation and chemotherapy in cervical cancer. Using preclinical models in vitro and in vivo, she is currently studying how these genomic alterations influence the tumor immune microenvironment and how targeted metabolic therapies can be used in combination with radiation and chemotherapy to improve treatment outcomes. With that, it is my pleasure to turn tonight's webinar over to Dr. Schwartz. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Mike S.B., um, and I hope you will uh, appreciate after this session, if you don't already, how incredibly wonderful and blessed we are to have some of the best in the business as our program officers and advocates in the, in the process as we navigate trying to get NIH funding. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Espy, he's the chief of the radiotherapy development branch in the radiation research, um, research program at the National Cancer Institute. Um, he manages support for research that advances our understanding of fundamental processes in cancer biology and its application to improve radiotherapies. Dr. Espy specializes in the development of specialized research programs and consortia with national impact that facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration and cooperation. He's board certified in clinical pathology with medical technologists experience in immunology, organ transplant, hematology, microbiology, virology, and transfusion medicine. Uh, he's worked at the University of Iowa, Georgetown, and the NIH Clinical Center. He received his PhD with distinction from Georgetown in biochemistry and physiology for work in intermediate metabolism in the immune system. And as an NIH intramural scientist at both the NCI and the NIDDK, Dr. SB conducted both base all, he does everything, <laughs> basic preclinical and translational research in biochemistry, neuropharmacology, immunology, infectious disease, cancer cell biology, and radiation biology. 
He has specialized expertise in redox biochemistry, something that's very near and dear to my heart in relation to cancer biology and therapeutic interventions, including radiation with strong interest in imaging and biophysical approaches. He was the NIH um, uh, Foundation for the Advancement of Education and Science Professor for Molecular and Cell uh, Biology. Dr. Espy has authored over 150 uh, scientific research articles, reviews, book chapters with approximately 20,000 citations, and he's active in peer review across very diverse fields of study. We are really honored to have you join us tonight. Uh, Dr. Espy, thank you for your time and looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Julie, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, my partner on this webinar, Dr. Bo Hong, who is the Scientific Review Officer, or SRO as they are known, for the Radiation Therapeutics and Biology Study Section, RTB. RTB is the nexus uh, review for almost all the uh, radiation research applications that come into the NCI, uh, and so she holds a very uh, prominent role in navigating uh, the fate of uh, research uh, for the entire field. And so it's a great honor to um, sort of uh, join, um, have Dr. Hong join us in this webinar today, and she brings uh, valuable insight into uh, the review side of it, whereas I cover uh, the program side. And that's more or less what we're going to go through today is uh, the entire grants process, uh, the distinction between the different roles that we play, uh, and uh, we'll wind up with uh, focusing on tips uh, for each of the review criteria. On this slide, uh, you can see a brief overview of um, the radiation research portfolio at NIH. In 2022, radiation research garnered approximately $300 million in support from the NIH uh, overall. The NCI funds as much of the radiation research portfolio as all the other institutes at NIH combined. Most awards, as shown in the pie chart in the center, are R01s, with R21s being a distant second. That's why we chose to focus uh, this webinar on both of those mechanisms, and we'll have a bit of a discussion about the distinction uh, between choosing for one or the other. On the right is a word cloud that I generated from application titles uh, that came in that pertain to radiation research in 2022. This is a brief overview of uh, the information that hopefully you'll glean from today's webinar. Uh, more or less, uh, we're gonna go through the questions that you see on the right, and then uh, sort of focus at the end on grantsmanship uh, tips. This slide is a parody of The Lion King, uh, the so-called grant circle of life. So beginning at uh, 12 o'clock at the top, you can see that the process begins with you as a PI in developing the rationale for the project and generating preliminary data. In the pre-application phase, you can always reach out to the relevant program or SRO for advice and guidance. The program director and the scientific review officer form a partnership, but our roles are distinct, and there is a firewall between the program directors and the SRO. We also work with receipt and referral to guide your application once submitted to the appropriate institute, program officer study section for review, uh, based on formal referral guidelines. If you have questions or um, concerns about where your application may be um, referred to, uh, it's always good to um, set up an appointment with either your program officer or the SRO um, prior to the application to make sure that it lands in the right spot. And we'll go through uh, some tips on how to um, navigate that uh, on your own as well. The SRO, um, is in charge of establishing the peer review panelists, running the review meetings, and writing up the review summary statement. Uh, so the SRO covers pretty much everything pertaining to review, whereas program uh, covers the pre-application phase and then the post-review phase. In post-review, the PD will pick up the thread again to either manage an award or facilitate and advise for next steps in a possible revision. The NCI has numerous resources about grants and training. For webinar participants who are interested in F and K awards, uh, I'd refer you to the NCI Center for Cancer Training, which has uh, a wealth of information, not only on those types of awards, but generally on uh, the grants process as well. And uh, again, as uh, Janelle said, uh, this slide deck will be available to you uh, after the webinar, and these links uh, then are clickable for you to find uh, these different sites. 
Another site that's uh, general for NIH wide, but is a really great resource for people who try and to uh, understand the grants process or find more information is the NIH Office of Extramural Research, or the OER, as it's called. Uh, they manage a, a very helpful tool known as the NIH Reporter, which is a searchable database for all NIH-funded research. Uh, and in this example, I input the uh, following search terms, radiation therapy, uh, metabolism, clicked on NCI, type one or so-called new applications, R01, and then I sorted by cost, and you can see uh, the results on the left. And this is a great tool in that uh, it can indicate to you who and what is funded in your research area. So if you want to see if your idea is completely novel or there's already several funded grants on this, you can use the NIH reporter tool uh, to sleuth that out. It also tells you um, uh, or gives you examples of what successful abstracts or aims look like. And so it's um, a great place to look and see what success looks like. And uh, you can kind of browse through the ones that are successfully funded in your area and kind of pick up some ideas of, oh, you know, I like the way they phrase that. You know, this makes sense to me. Maybe I'll mimic that in, in mind uh, in, in terms of style, not necessarily the content. Uh, this is also a great tool to figure out where your proposal um, could go. In other words, is it appropriate for the institute or study section? Uh, you can click on um, applications that uh, were funded out of the um, RTB specifically and see what kind of things are um, successfully coming out of RTB, for instance. So let's take a moment to review some terminology associated with the grants process. The uh, R um, awards are, are um, research project grants. So R01s typically is the big one, R21, R15, R03, and so on. U grants uh, are not actually grants, but cooperative agreements. And those are different in that uh, those often um, have a strong relationship with program in terms of uh, guiding and advising uh, how those awards will go um, over the project period. And they can often be large center grants, but it can also be the equivalent of an R01, so-called U01. But the difference is uh, that they're usually part of uh, a network or consortia and things like that. The uh, P grants, uh, P01s, P30s, P50s like SPORs, uh, are large uh, projects that have multiple components, center grants, things like that. As I mentioned, uh, K awards, we're not going to talk about those um, today, but you can find those at the uh, Center for Cancer Training, more information. On the right, you'll see um, omnibus. You know, often people will say, oh, did you apply to the omnibus? What that means is that you're sending in an unsolicited application. In other words, it's just your idea and you send it in and it's not in response to any specific um, call or FOA. So those will be routed to a chartered study section like RTB for peer review. On the other hand, solicited applications um, are the kind of applications that are called for through these so-called FOAs or funding opportunity announcements. Those often involve a special emphasis panel or a SEP, and they can be in the form of RFAs, requests for applications, where there's a specific set aside or amount that's dedicated by the institutes for that particular FOA. Another kind of solicited application is a PAR, which is a program announcement with review, which means that uh, it's a, a topical focused area and often there's a special emphasis panel associated with that. So let's talk a little bit more about unsolicited applications. Uh, the unsolicited proposals are received uh, on a regular cycle three times per year in February, June, and October. They're referred to the appropriate CSR study section based on the science that's proposed. The majority of unsolicited applications reviewed in these chartered study sections are R01s. That's really the bread and butter of the unsolicited uh, route. A far second place is R21s. You can see on the lower panel, I have Bo's uh, webpage where she lists uh, sort of what the uh, um, description of the RTB study section is. There's her re, um, her contact information. You can also click and see uh, who's been on the review panel um, and so forth. And so uh, it's a really good resource to sort of sleuth out um, the study section uh, beforehand to get a sense of uh, who's in that and uh, what they're looking for. So each standing uh, study section has their own web page with the description, rosters, and SOL contact information. Again, you can use the reporter tool to see what kinds of applications are reviewed in that study section that uh, then are awarded 
Um, and you can also uh, have it uh, serve as a way to seek out advice from the SRO um, or the program directors. Here we're looking at uh, the so-called solicited route. The solicited proposals, again, are submitted in response to a targeted funding opportunity announcement like the RFAs. Typically, they'll undergo peer review in a special emphasis panel. And one way to find uh, what's coming out, what's new uh, in your area, is to look at what they call the guide. And the guide is run by, again, this um, OER, the Office of Extramural Research. And it's really uh, a daily listing of all the different FOAs uh, that are being put out by all the different institutes. But you can pare it down and click on just NCI um, uh, or just uh, specific mechanisms. So here in my example, I highlighted NCI and radiation as my key search terms. Uh, <clears throat> so um, on the right are um, two FOAs that I currently have open, so-called pairs and stripe. And uh, if you want to find out information, typically once they're announced, then program will convene an informational webinar where you can find out more information about what it is and uh, you know what the goals are. Um, but for solicited and our targeted FOAs, it's um, often advisable to seek out advice from the program director. And that information, the contact information, is always contained within the FOA. And often uh, there's a team of people involved in, in these uh, types of application solicitations. So I thought uh, we'd spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the difference between R01s and R21s. This comes up often for uh, younger scientists uh, that are trying to make a decision, oh, you know, I, I don't have enough data, they think, uh, for a full R01 application. Should I go for an R21? Is an R21 like a baby R01? Um, so let's go through that a little bit. The R21, as you see on the left, is really meant to be a high-risk, high-reward research grant. Uh, so it's true that no preliminary data is required, although if you have it, you can put it in uh, to support the rationale for your idea. Typically, the R21s uh, support up to a maximum of $250,000 per year direct costs and are only for two years. It is not a mini R01. Again, it is intended to be something that's the high risk, high reward. Uh, so the R21 does have a lower pay line. In other words, it's more competitive to get an R21 and it's less money, less time. Uh, but if you have a highly innovative or new conceptual idea, that merits, you know, just let's see if this works type of um, application, then that, that is appropriate for the R21. So I call that the wow factor, uh, where review puts a premium on technolo technological or conceptual innovation and also on significance. Um, you know, is this really something that, if it worked, would be a home run for the field and really have a huge impact? That's the R21. On the other hand, the R01. For review, there's a very high expectation of preliminary data that's sufficient to support the premise and rationale. So that doesn't mean by default you go with the R21. It simply means that you should really have uh, a good war chest of preliminary data that supports the premise and rationale before you submit the R01 application, if that makes sense. There's a higher expectation of feasibility with the R01, whereas not so much with the R21 because it's a high risk uh, mechanism. The money is much bigger and longer for the R01. It supports up to 500K in direct cost per year, and it's a full five-year research plan. The pay line is actually better uh, than the R21. Right now, it's at 10th percentile and 15th percentile if you're an early stage investigator. So this slide is a, a summary of um, review criteria and scoring, and it's a bit packed, uh, so let's go through it. And we'll go through each of the review criterion individually in the next couple of slides, significance, investigator, and so on. Um, but the idea is that each of those criterion are scored one through nine, um, the highest or best being one and the lowest being nine. Uh, and those accumulate then uh, into an overall impact score. Uh, and as shown, the assessment of the likelihood for the project to exert a sustained powerful influence on the research field. And this is pretty much the central question that the reviewers ponder when they give that um, score. These individual scores are then averaged and multiplied by 10 to get the final priority score. Uh, so for example, if uh, everybody's a three, uh, it ends up being a 30, um, for example. 
again, the entire panel um, votes, except for those that have to leave the room that are in conflict. And so you'll have typically three primary reviewers that are assigned uh, to discuss the application and present it to the entire panel, but the entire panel casts a vote. Uh, and so that's important to remember that it's just not the three primary reviewers, uh, it's the entire panel that's voting. So what are my chances for success? <clears throat> so the stars uh, indicate the two areas that are often the greatest score driving weakness, as they say in grantsmanship parlance, significance and approach. So what you can see on the right here is um, significance. Again, the scores uh, are given um, between um, one through nine, and then they're multiplied. And so if you get um, a score of one, that's great on significance. Uh, typically, the grants that are funded uh, you see are in green or blue. Those that start to creep into um, not being funded are in yellow, and then the gray bars are those that are not discussed. So you can see um, applicants that get scores of, say, around four on average and maybe five on approach are the ones that typically fall into the not discussed pile. Also, you can see on innovation, uh, the not discussed uh, group has a pretty strong uh, bar there for a lack of innovation, more or less. But uh, almost invariably, uh, people will get pretty good scores on investigator and environment, uh, pretty good on innovation, but it's really approach and significance are the main ones that uh, will make or break an application. Okay, so let's go through each of these uh, scoring criteria uh, in a bit more detail. So the first two points are, are pretty obvious that, you know, does your study address an important problem? Is it relevant to the Institute's mission and aligned with the study section? So that, those are pretty easy to knock out. Um, I'd like you to focus on the next two. In terms of significance, the way to think about it is, assuming everything worked as planned, would it advance the field? And if you can articulate that point in your significance section, in other words, it's not only about you and your idea, your specific hypothesis, but a, a broader viewpoint uh, to take that and say, well, what impact would this have for the entire field if it really worked out? And this is, um, it's just a human thing that it's often a hook that will pique the interest of the review panel. In other words, the entire panel may not be a deep expert as you are on the particular topic that you're applying to, but if you can explain how, if it all worked out, it would broadly advance the field and make a big impact, then you're drawing them in with significance. And once they start to get on board with that, then they listen in a sharper way to all the other elements uh, within the uh, application. So don't underestimate the importance of significance. Investigator, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Does the team have the documented expertise and experience to perform the proposed aims? One tip here is to use your bias sketch to overview um, your program and your motivation, your vision, in addition to listing just what you've done. So that way uh, the reviewers can get a better sense of, you know, well, what's driving this application? Why, why did they pick this particular topic? And so you can explain that through your uh, bio sketch that you know your motivation, your vision is to really focus on this problem because X, Y, Z. And that adds, you know, more of a human quality to it. So they see you as um, an applicant that's really motivated to do this as opposed to just a person that's listing accomplishments and things like that. Environment's pretty straightforward, uh, that you have the institutional support, uh, a leadership plan or a mentorship plan is important for ESIs. Uh, there's no shame in, in saying that you have a group of mentors at your institution or that you formed uh, sort of a, a mini committee that would help guide you and discuss results and things like that. You can put that into um, your application. It doesn't have to go on for a long time, but make it real. Um, you know, say how you meet, say, by WebEx, you know, on a monthly basis to discuss data, um, talk about approaches, things like that. Of course, letters of support are vital. Uh, if you have omission of that, then reviewers uh, will question, um, you know, that this element is missing and, uh, you know, where is it? So it's really crucial, especially for ESIs to have those letters of support um, from the relevant um, people that uh, would be involved in the application. Innovation, it can be conceptual or technological. 
Are there advances or approaches, novel model systems that enable testing of the hypothesis or achieving the aims? How much originality is apparent in the proposed aims? And avoid the criticism of being incremental. Uh, it's a delicate balance, especially for younger investigators. Often they try to pack in too much and they're accused of having um, an overambitious uh, application. On the other hand, if you are too um, shallow on that uh, and you just inch you know, one step forward from perhaps the last paper that you published or, or something that's already known in the field, then it's not too interesting in terms of innovation and you'll have the criticism of being incremental. So try to hit that balance just right. Uh, that you're not overreaching, but on the other hand, it's not underwhelming. Okay, approach. Again, as I mentioned, it's usually the main score driving determinant. And uh, we'll go through each of these. Um, does the preliminary data support the rationale and experimental design? Is it hypothesis driven? Uh, that can be important. Often reviewers resonate with hypotheses, um, but it's not always you know, necessarily so if there's uh, the type of research proposal that um, isn't grounded in hypothesis research, but is more um, sort of um, moving forward without that. Um, if so, um, does your plan verify or validate your hypothesis? You know, do you really get um, the design put together in a way that leads you to an unambiguous question? And uh, again, there's um, clear and clean data that people want. They want to address the question, um, does it support the hypothesis or not? So it doesn't necessarily have to lead to supporting the hypothesis. The nature of science, of course, will take you to new hypotheses um, by virtue of going through the project period and testing those ideas. Um, with that, do you have alternative strategies if the proposed plan does not work? Uh, so the best laid plans aren't necessarily what uh, follows with the science, but can you anticipate those and have strategies to have workarounds in case those um, ideas um, don't follow through and come to fruition? The experimental details need to be uh, sufficiently detailed for the reviewers to follow. In other words, um, you don't have to go into the minutia of uh, the different salts inside the PBS buffer. On the other hand, if it's important that uh, the buffer is a certain pH or, or something like that, then go ahead and, and note those details. Uh, but again, keep it focused with a logical flow. Explain to them your logic and reasoning behind why you chose this experiment and what it intends to show. It's also important to present a timeline. Is a proposed timeline uh, or time frame realistic? Lastly, uh, let's talk about feasibility with preliminary data. So preliminary data can show um, that you have the capability to do these experiments. So the feasibility um, to support the uh, specific aims is there. If there's something that's um, very um, sort of risky in terms of, you know, can you even uh, do these experiments, then you're going to be on shaky ground for approach uh, for sure. It's OK, of course, to uh, draw upon or cite the work of others that supports the premise. But it's important to show that um, the types of assays and things that you're proposing to do are working in your laboratory or that you have sort of the technological or, or model systems needed uh, for the project in hand or that you're nearly there if you're developing some sort of model system. So what are your chances for success? Uh, this is a complicated graph, but I'll walk you through it. Basically, uh, this lists um, all the percentile R01 applications, the awards and success rates. And so you see on the left with the green fundable pay line, it's one through 10-ish. Those are the uh, applications that received a fundable score that were within the pay line. <clears throat> As we move from 10th percentile into the teens, you're kind of on the bubble. And with that, uh, there's a process called pay by exception where some of the grants that are beyond the pay line uh, compete then for the last bits of money that's available to support those um, to award, but not all of them that are in that zone um, can make it because it's a finite sort of um, amount of extra money that's in the system. And so um, that's a possibility, but it's not a guarantee for sure. And then certainly as you move uh, deeper into the teens, into the 20s and then beyond, uh, revision is needed uh, for the award. So 
of the applications that were received uh, in this um, period for getting the data, which is drawn from uh, at least 10 years ago, uh, about 38% of the grants that were funded had rankings that were in um, the pay line area to give you a sense of what the success rate is. Okay, so this is the last slide. And uh, we do have some extra slides that will be included in the, um, the slide deck package. But for the sake of today's uh, uh, webinar, uh, we wanted to leave at least half the time uh, for your questions um, to be addressed. But these are just general grantsmanship tips, uh, not necessarily for any type of mechanism. So the general advice is to always soundboard ideas before writing. And it's often helpful to uh, find colleagues that aren't necessarily right next door to you in your department, but <clears throat> somebody down the hall that's a scientist, but it's not a deep expert in your area. And that helps um, sort of you hone your message to speak to, in other words, the entire panel uh, of reviewers, uh, because for sure there's uh, experts in all different areas, uh, but not deep experts on um, only one topic. And so again, the entire panel votes. And so it's good to have a message that resonates with uh, any scientist that reads your application. As you write, get feedback, and it's an iterative process. Uh, use easily understood illustrations. Provide a clear message, logical flow. Uh, one point here I want to emphasize is that every section of the grant is important. So everybody, you know, really focuses very hard on their specific aims and their research strategy. But if you kind of whiff on the other portions, review is going to note that and say, well, you know, they didn't really fill this out or we don't understand, you know, they just left this blank and uh, or it's not well formed. And it starts to then snowball of, you know, they're not really enthusiastic because it's not a complete package that they're looking at. So make sure every part of the grant is tight uh, and that you don't skip on any steps. And often those elements, those other portions of it, are ones that they're more than happy to give you good scores on, but if you don't provide the information, then they they can't do that. Also, it's important to you know show what the horizon is. What does success look like after five years? You know, do you have a, a trajectory that you're looking at, and then a plan that's sustained um, through the project period? In other words, you have a vision; it's not just a one-off. Uh, include objective discussion of alternative interpretations and approaches. Um, and then lastly, do not submit this prematurely. If you feel like you're rushed or you're not ready, then you probably are not, and um, it'll crumble uh, in review. So on the right side, the pitfalls then are the antithesis of that, the weak rationale, that the premise is not supported by your data, that you tried cramming too much in there, that there is irrelevant things or the logical flow wasn't there, people couldn't follow it. Scope issues are important, as we discussed. Uh, don't be overambitious. Don't clutter it with tangential data. There's no need to put in every experiment that you ever did. Uh, just focus on the ones that really are key to understanding what you want to do with this proposal. And then lastly, the idea of superficial design or that you're incremental. And so this concludes uh, the webinar portion. And we'll just open it up to questions and answers, and Julie's going to moderate that for us. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, thanks. So we have a couple questions in the chat, so I'm just going to start with those. Um, the first one is, what is the success rate of non-U.S. applicants? Is it better to add a U.S. investigator as a co-PI, and would a Canadian funding history be understood by the review panel? And I guess it's sort of a Secondary question would be how how could you use the bio sketch to describe, you know, uh, Canadian Canadian funding history, for example? <laughs> or do you have suggestions there? That's a great question. Well, I'll throw that to Bo first um, because she deals with you know foreign applicants and the nuances with that, and then um, I'll chime in. Well. Um... First of all, when we look at investigators, we look at the whole team, whether they are qualified, um, be able to carry out the research as proposed. Then we look at the, if it's a foreign PI, we look at the justification why um, this has to be outside of the United States to carry out the research. So if it has justified your unique resources, unique talents to do this research facility or all kinds of whatever reason you think is unique uh, to us, 
then people review that theory, actually. So for us, at our satisfaction, uh, that justification is about the only thing we ever look at. Other than that, everything's known, just like the US applicants. Thanks, Bo. Right, so the foreign applicant has to have a justification of why they're right. unique uh, in, in research. So to give an example, if the application is all about um, um, using uh, RNA-seq and looking at single cell things, and uh, then it'd be hard pressed to say that nobody inside the United States is, is doing that. Um, but if that was a consequence of using some special instrumentation that was developed at the foreign site that's not available in the US, then that you know would tilt towards it. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of finding partners, often that is something that does help um, sort of strengthen it. In other words, you know, there's this international team that's been formed and each of them bring, you know, these unique qualities uh, to the table, um, some of which are, you know, in foreign sites and, and some of which are uh, in the U.S., but it's a collaborative team. And so then mm -hmm. everything's copacetic. Okay, great. Uh, we'll move on to the next question from the chat. For the fiscal year 2023, will the R01 and R21 pay line, which is currently 10%, be expected to increase? The NCI is in continuing resolution, we believe. I'm, I'm wondering, um, Mike, if you could spend some time explaining the timing of how we find out what the pay lines are. And then I have a follow-up question here that I want to address regarding early stage investigators and new investigators and those pay lines and how people can understand what those are, because we have a lot of early stage and new investigators on the call today. Right. Uh, so the change in pay line or determination of pay line uh, involves uh, many different elements. And so NIH generally has money appropriated by Congress, and, and that is a finite amount. And then that's divvied up to the different institutes by the NIH director. Then the NCI director um, consults with the budget team to figure out, you know, what are the obligations that they have and so on. And so ultimately that falls into what they call the pay line you know, at what level of uh, the scores from peer review can they have awarded and, and at what level do they make the cut um, to, to not fund. And so obviously uh, they can't be, um, um, you know, too gracious if they don't have the budget to support it by having, you know, what we all want, uh, a very liberal pay line. Um, then they can't meet those obligations. So they tend to be somewhat conservative at the start, especially if there's a continuing resolution where the Congress has not allocated those funds. So it's a sort of a big mystery where that money, you know, the dollar amount will land. And so they're a little more conservative and they, they might peel back the pay line, uh, which they recently did. Um, they scaled it back. It was, you know, hovering around 14 and then 12 and then 11 and now it's at 10. So it changes, you know, often and um, the tighter it gets, then of course, the harder it is and people have to keep applying that are doing essentially great work, but there's just not enough money to uh, support it based on the current pay line. Uh, but the best efforts are made then to adjust that as time goes on, if they know, you know, what the budget allocations are and the forecasts of, you know, what they're already funding and um, you know, what new things that are coming in, what things are sort of sunsetting, then uh, they make every effort that, to elevate that um, as possible as the year goes on. But when they do that, it's really up to the NCI director and the leadership team with the budget office to, to do that. And so it's um, something that we find out about not much before everybody else does <laughs> from program's perspective. Yeah, and um, I, th I think it's important if if you've never experienced this before, if you're sending in your first grant to never underutilize your helpful 
uh, program officers to help decode the process of your funding score and what your next steps would be. And, you know, they, they can't tell you specifically what, what to do to make your grant better, but if they tell you to prepare a resubmission, go ahead and prepare the resubmission. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and that's helpful. I, 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 I think many people have always been in the situation to be on the bubble and to not be funded and to try to figure out what's next steps. I think every investigator lives in this zone and and your program officers are amazing resources that can help you navigate and figure out what to do next. Um, okay, great. So we're gonna move on to another question from the chat. This is, um, could you describe uh, situations in which a grant received a fundable score? I think in terms of the, percentile scoring, um, but uh, would would not actually be funded. Um, what would, would there be such a situation? Like for example, if the pay line is, let me know if you ask this question, you wanna give me a little bit more detail if I'm not interpreting this correctly from your chat, but um, perhaps are you describing a scenario where the score would be eighth percentile and somehow the funding uh, would not be received that year if the pay line was 10th percentile. Does such a thing, has such a thing ever happened and and what would be the reasons for that? Yeah, on, on rare occasions, if the pay line, you know, suddenly changes and they try not to do this where they, you know, yank people around, um, but it can be a situation where, you know, in a prior round, what seemed like it was a fundable score with the pay line in the subsequent round if the pay line has changed, it's no longer fundable. Um, but often, you know, they try to um, complete one cycle so nobody is sort of caught in a, you know, in-between phase or, or something like that. And the second part of this question is for the support level of R21s, I think there's a typo here, but is it 125,000 per year for a total of 250,000 over the two year life of the grant or is it or is it you can have $250,000 a year for two years in a row? Um, aggregate 250 total. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's 125,000 per year. Right. Uh, right. You can pretty much propose any budget if it's reasonable. But then again, you know, R21 is always small. So. Right, right. Yeah. So reveal, the review may peel that back and say, yeah, you know, that's not a justified budget for that two year period, or it's, you know, just beyond. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, if you're, you know, way outside of the norm, then program may have no choice but to uh, cut that budget anyway, if you got a good score, um, because, you know, it's beyond the norm of what's being paid. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we're going to move on to the next uh, question in the chat here, but it's over a topic that I get a lot of questions from my own faculty at WashU, especially uh, junior faculty, about what really is considered novel and new preliminary data to put into a grant application. Oftentimes, people are trying to figure out how to frame this in the context of like they're working on a paper, you know, and they have figures that they wanna publish in this paper. And obviously they're not gonna duplicate all those figures into the grant, but they don't wanna receive the criticism that, well, this is not novel anymore because you've already published it. Um, it's, so I would love your opinion and advice on, on what to do about that. Is it really only considered novel new preliminary data for a grant if it's a figure you've never shown before in any of your published work? That, that's a question I get a lot. Um, and uh, maybe we'll stop there and get your advice on that and then move on to some of the other prelim data questions. Okay, um, Bo, why don't you go ahead first? Okay, um, we actually got some questions sometimes from reviewers try to, when they evaluate different applications, they will um, somehow ask that question because they encounter different applications. So the general, Feeling I have is if it's something significant you want to support your uh, uh, significant section is already published, you just describe and cite in the significant section. But if you want to present as primary data to support your approach and experimental design, then I have to better off be new. Make sense? 
Right. Yes. Um, thanks for that clarification. And then I guess another thing that's uh, difficult for people now is sort of the timing in which, let's say you're submitting a paper, especially to, you know, some of these big journals, they'll hold on to it for a long time. Things might get stuck in review for two years and so on. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you want to put things in your um, in your grant to kind of show feasibility that you have knowledge in this area, that you're publishing in this area. Um, and sometimes people consider putting their stuff up on other publicly available um, avenues, such as bioarchive, you know, mm -hmm. and people struggle with that decision. But I'm wondering if you could give a little bit of advice about especially during the pandemic, I, I had this situation myself where the journals were kind of behind in terms of getting things out online. And, you know, when the reviewers can't look up your paper and find it with one click of a button, they, they get mad. <laughs> so yeah. that's what, what's, also, your, what's your advice there about the use of bioarchive? As that's also another question I often get. Remember that this right now we have one additional page you can submit before 30 days before the review meeting. So that gave you some win window for the situation like that. I've always accepted those additional one page for all the last how many, three, two, three years so far because of the same reason. And as I said before, if it's published to try it, you can cite them, support your significance, justification, prior premise, whatever in the significant section, but for the new data, preliminary data section, you should always use the new one. Now for the things you already submitted but not published yet and maybe not available to the reviewers when they want to see something, I think if it's important results, you think people cannot find them easily, then put them into as a preliminary data, like one figure or some paragraph description, um, then people can at least see it. They may question and say, hey, you know, this just been published the day, the week before the meeting takes place, but at least they see the results in your application. Mm -hmm. That's my take on that. I'll just add on that, uh, again, explaining why you chose to show that data, that particular figure, and explain that to the reviewer in the text of your um, research plan. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes clear to them, oh, you know, they're getting into your thought process. This applicant has chosen to show me this data because it illustrates X, Y, Z, as yes. opposed to just showing it and assuming that they get it. Um, yeah, do not assuming it. people know. <laughs> yeah, because and, uh, if you think about the opposite, that you you didn't say you just said, oh, you know, I already put into uh, submit a paper. You should be able to see it online, whatever place you know it's online. You should search for that. But the thing is, oftentimes for various reasons, people to not see it. But if it's really, really important, key pieces of data and a figure, put them into your application pages, mm -hmm. right. okay? So they can so, see it. It's all so, uh, sent to me as one page additional supplementary data before the 30 days before the meeting. Right. So that's an important distinction between a research paper and your grant proposal. In other words, you're drawing upon different sources of information, different styles for different reasons to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And the grant proposal is really projecting five years for the R01 into the future. And so if you're just kind of showing what you've already done and um, it's not used as a tool to then justify you know, your future plans, how you're gonna build on that, yes. then it does come across as, well, they're just showing me their paper. And you know, it's not that innovative because they're not showing me where they're moving beyond that. And so it comes across as kind of flat and not innovative, but it's used as a springboard to say, well, this is what we can do and this is what we've done, or you know, it's, it's published or nearly published or unpublished, it doesn't matter. But if it's portrayed in a way that shows, you know, with this, then over five years, we can build out this story that's mm -hmm. completely new and different. Then they see that you've sort of charted a course based on you know, what you've been doing. And so that's kind of the difference between the short circumspect story that a research article would have and this idea of a five-year project plan that you're putting together for your grant proposal. Right. Um, so we're going to jump back into the chat. We're getting lots of questions here. Good discussion. Um, so while we're on the topic of preliminary data and figures and figure placement into the grant, let's let's spend a little bit more time on that because there's a few more questions here. 
So one question is, should prelim data be only in the approach section or can some be in significance? And I think you answered that question a little bit earlier, um, Bo, it was sort of the idea that key figures that are from public data might live better in the significance section. You can have a dedicated preliminary data section that's separatable, that has all your new stuff. And then it's really cool, I think, as a reviewer and as a grant writer myself, I try to pepper additional figures throughout the rest of the grant to illustrate the strategies and my capability to use those strategies within the approach. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Bo or Mike, about styles of where people put figures in the research strategy? And then I get this question all the time. Do I need to have a figure on my specific aims page? Well, that's a that's a question people ask me before because it used to be you cannot put figures into the specific aim. I still often for say if you don't have to, don't put in. But if you think it's really, 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 really important that you you want people to see, you could try. I, I don't often see figures in a specific game, to be honest, because that's, you know, there's a page limit there. So why would you spend space on, on a figure when you can just expand the whole picture with all the aims, what you want to do, future direction and important things. So then mm -hmm. that comes next page, you can already start with different figures, description, all the, uh, so that that's my take. But once in a while, when I see something in the specific aim, I wouldn't toss that. But I would say you you probably want to leave that specific aim page for bigger, the whole picture description thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think an overview figure at the beginning of your research strategy is fine to show. Yes. You know, snapshot of how the different elements fit together. In a yeah, that, that's because, that's helpful. Yeah. So yeah. that's a guidepost for the reviewers to kind of refresh their. Um, ideas of how they're going to approach the proposal because they get a, a quick sort of snapshot of it. Um, but I agree with Bo that on the specific aims page, uh, you should paint the picture with words and try to be as clear and concise with, with words mm -hmm. on the page as opposed to pictures. In terms of the significance section, uh, again, you know, that's the um, the impact, you know, if this was to work, you know, would it have impact for the field? And so the figures might be more on uh, statistical data or things like that, you know, a chart that shows how many people are afflicted with, you know, X, Y, or Z or, or what's going on, you know, from that perspective of the field, not necessarily primary data, experimental data, um, doesn't seem appropriate to me for the significant section. But if it's describing, you know, what the problem is that you're trying to address, then yes. Yeah. Okay, great. great. We're going to dive back into the chat here. Uh, this is a very good question. Is there any ever a recourse when you feel like your review was unfair? The slide 13 that you showed included a bar graph charting scores, environment ranges from one to a bit over two. We received a three with no weaknesses listed and we're a top level research university. This is just one example. Um, and this brings up a lot of important points that grant writers and uh, reviewers see all the time in their summary statements. And every single person who has had one success has had 10 or 20 or more failures. And I find it very frustrating myself and also to have my own faculty when weakness, you know, low scores are given and no discrete weaknesses are listed by the reviewer. It's exceptionally hard to help develop a plan to do a resubmission when you don't have itemized weaknesses. Um, so can y'all discuss what, how do you encourage reviewers to try to be discreet about listing out weaknesses and what recourses do grant writers have when they get a summary statement and they're, they're really baffled and trying to decode it like it's being described in this question? Mike, you want me to? Yeah, that's for you, bro, all the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, remember there was one slide in your extra slides page? Because we got this uh, uh, no weakness, but still the, the the score is just like in the medium range, four to six. But apparently there's not much of weaknesses given at all. This is usually the situation, like the reviewer thinks, even without much weaknesses at all, even you carried out the research successfully, 
still the overall impact would be medium to the field. In this case, we often see, not just once, twice, it's often time we see them giving a score four, three or worse. And, and that's why, because it's actually in the instruction of the overall scoring impact instruction from CSR. So this is not just a unique situation to one or two applications. It's just the overall whole grant together. Review, despite there's not much of weaknesses at all, review did not think this will have a huge impact in the field, relevant field. That's most likely what I see often. Okay. Yeah. I always tell people that peer review is a human process, you know, and so sometimes the peer reviewers, you know, do drop the ball a little bit and they, they didn't list specific things for environment, you know, why was that a three, not a one, um, but there's probably other, you know, issues that they were focused on that they gave advice that drove the score. So it's unlikely just, you know, a score of three on environment was the thing that sank it. There was probably other things going on. Um, I don't know, but um, often it's sort of a, as Bo was describing, a general gestalt at the end of the overall impact that is driving their decision to put it into, you know, ones and twos versus three, fours or, or fives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes you really want these concrete instructions about what it is that you can do to fix it. Um, and sometimes it's just that the reviewers just didn't really connect with the material, you know, for whatever reason. And, and that's hard. That's hard. Um, and one of the best pieces of advice I got and I, when I was starting out, and I still think of it all the time, is that you can think about your grant and the reviewer as like a favorable receptor ligand interaction, right? And you're just trying to go for that favorable interaction every time. And sometimes you just have to keep pummeling it <laughs> with ligand. You just got to keep on trying, you know, because sometimes it just doesn't connect for, for whatever reason. It's impossible to predict reviewer biases and point of view, you know, and that's why you got to keep submitting. I also um, want to mention something else here for RTB, because people often, for, if they give one, two, three, um, that's actually the top scores together. Because RTB usually, uh, for example, the percentile versus uh, score, if you get a score of 30 for RTB, right now it's, it's eighth percentile. Mm -hmm. So for them to write a lot of negatives about a score of three, when well, you think about it, it's still fully fundable score, eighth percentile. They're not gonna write a lot of negatives at all, right? So three is actually a good score for us. But of course, some other studies actually, they have a history of often give too many ones or twos, then your score of 20 could be a percentile. So that's 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 why sometimes you see, you have to see which study session you're coming out from. For us, score of three is a very good score. Mm -hmm. And you often don't see much negative with studies. Mm -hmm. Bo brings up a great point that, you know, each study section kind of has their own culture uh, of mm -hmm. sorts. And so, you know, some are tough as nails and are really, you know, pummeling things, but the percentiling then uh, takes care of that. Whereas mm -hmm. others, you know, love everything and, and everything's so great. Um, and then you get a 15%. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, so, this, this is a great segue into the next question, because I'd really love to know, Mike, in your experience, where is RTB? Is it tough as nails or is it, you know, we love everything? And there's a question in the chat, I think it's really, really important. What are the priorities of the RTB study section right now? Are there specific topics that fit into the portfolio? Are there topics that are doing really well right now that were doing well a year ago and now are just sinking? I mean, you know, people are looking for any any advice, anything that can help because it's our only radiation focused study section. Right. Uh, well, I'll let Bo cover the the philosophy of, and, and the trends that she sees, but from my perspective. RTB is very interesting because it covers such a wide swath of science. So, uh, you know, there's the uh, the chemistry and, and the the free radical uh, things going on at that level, uh, going through the radiation biology, uh, then all the way up through clinical trials and you know imaging modalities and 
medical mm -hmm. physics and technology and you know it's all wrapped in there and uh, on one hand you know that's the the beauty of it that we love uh, for this field um, but on the other hand it's challenging for the review committee in particular because again everybody on the panel votes and so you know you have such a wide range of diverse expertise represented um, it does I think pay dividends to explain why you chose this problem, what you're addressing, your logic of going through it, because somebody that's not really in that space all the time uh, may not be aware of those elements, and uh, if they're not explained, then that's where they have that sort of lack of uh, enthusiasm for it, because it's just not put on the page. And so I think, you know, speaking to that uh, general audience in a way that explains, you know, why this uh, application and this approach you know, merits those dollars is important and will pay off dividends. And I'll hand it to Bo to uh, talk more about the philosophy of the study section and the trends that she's seen. Well, actually, being like uh, Dr. Espy said, we pretty much cover anything related to radiation research, including biology, physics, imaging, uh, oncology, radiation oncology, all these different therapy treatment. So we have a huge description page on the website, if anyone searches RTB study session NIH, you can find the public page. Now, having said that, of course, from rounds to rounds, year to year, you can see the trends, like we're getting um, much more radio immunotherapy imaging for this grant now, way more than 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, when I started more than 10 years ago, I only have one medical physicist. But now it's like a whole panel, you know, I have one third of people on radiation physics and imaging, radio immunotherapy and now they're bringing the immunotherapy part in, to us so we have a lot of changes but um i always keep like for example if if it's radiation biology grants they usually go to radiation biologist reviewers so i almost have like uh, three or four clusters of different reviewers biologists oncologists mm -hmm. and physicists the imaging specialists all these things so they don't really um go across that much. So I wouldn't assign a radiation, I mean, radio immunotherapy grants to a biologist. No, that's not possible to do. So also your, the, the discussed application scores are determined mainly by the three assigned reviewers. So those are the, the ones that give the final score will decide the score range. So everybody in the panel, even if you have 30, 40 people on the panel that particular day when this application is discussed, they have to have a good reason why they are voting outside of the score range set by those assigned reviewers. So your grants, even being so broad at RTB, the grants in a specific area are still by, reviewed by the experts in that particular field. And then everybody else will chime in and vote to the final score, but they have to discuss and explain why they go outside the score range. Otherwise, they will vote within the score set by those assigned reviewers. So that, that's the policy with, with CSI also. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that works both ways, um, correct, Bo? In other words, mm -hmm. somebody might say, you know, I really, really, really love this. Yeah, you, you can, you can explain to the it. panel, yes, yeah. and, and vote. Or somebody might way. say, you know, I, I don't like it at all, and I'm sticking with my, you know. Um, five, six, seven, work, eight. Yeah, right. five, six, seven, eight, right. Yeah. Now they have to explain, and then we we are you you are at our meetings. We are very careful with those outside of a score range. Uh, mm -hmm. Every every discussed application, we go through the ritual, try to make sure uh, yeah. it's fair to people. Yeah, I think yeah. this is also a good lesson for reviewers. You know, the first couple of times you review, you're not quite sure. You know, you're timid to speak up. Maybe it's a little intimidating. But it's really your job to advocate for the grants in your pile that you really think are good. Sometimes I think as reviewers, we feel like our job is to identify problems. But I would argue the issue is almost to do the opposite with as much energy and enthusiasm, right, to make sure that your fellow reviewers understand why you yes. really like to grants in your pile. Keep it. Mm -hmm. keep it up That's right. Up. Yeah. Um, Okay, very good. We're in the last question on the chat, and I think we're getting close to time. This is a good question, too. Um, as a reviewer, I hate acronyms. Are there stylistic mistakes that people make um, in the research strategy, too many abbreviations, or even more subtle things, things about the new format biosketch, or 
you know, things in your letters of support? Are there, are there things that, have you been seeing conversations on Twitter about font sizes and how many spaces to put after periods? And like, if you don't do this, then, oh, I hate it when I read, I mean, I'm like reading this stuff going, give me a break, people. If it's good science, you can't be obsessing about the spaces after the periods, but that's just me. So what are some stylistic things that you think really come out in the review process that you hear about consistently that that rub reviewers the wrong way? You want to try first or you want? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, if the application is written in a dense fashion, in other words, you know, every single piece of white space is covered with something, <laughs> you know, uh, that it's it's like a concrete block that you're presenting to the reviewers. Uh, then that's how they view it as a concrete block, and uh, so you know try to um, think about stylistically a logical flow and the best way to do that, and often to clutter it with just way too much information, it will backfire because then they lose you know what is the important information here because there's all this extra information that is not really on target. Uh, the other point is that um, um, it's okay to have a controversial um, area. In other words, um, often I hear people say, oh, you know, I, I have something that's going against the dogma for the field. And, you know, what do I do about that? Because, you know, these reviewers are the ones that establish that dogma. And, you know, how are they going to view, you know, my challenge to that? Um, the way to do it is often to present the argument in an agnostic way. In other words, that, you know, this is a controversial area. There's two sides to the coin that, you know, one side believes this, but there's this alternate view. Uh, and then present a design that tests that. And, and people love that because what you're saying is that you're not picking sides. You're not, you know, all in for your hypothesis and the other one is trash. You're testing it like a scientist and you're agnostic to it and, you know, let the chips fall as they may. And so, Often that works pretty well to um, allay those concerns. Uh, and so stylistically, I think, you know, not being um, so wedged to your hypothesis that you don't allow any, you know, alternate course of action to be considered in your project can also backfire where then reviewers will uh, uh, say that it's, you know, inflexible and, and, you know, what about this alternative thing? Uh, Lastly, um, I guess is the crime of omission. So if you, you know, fail to put in some sort of thing that would be expected by most reviewers, uh, then they'll fill it in with the darkest thoughts that they can come up with. <laughs> so in <laughs> other words, you know, uh, they didn't talk about, you know, X. And so, you know, either they didn't know about it, they're not aware of it, or, you know, they have no plan for that. And so if there is something that, you know, is kind of the elephant in the room situation, you know, embrace it and go ahead and describe, you know, why this is an issue and, and what your plan is to address it. Because if you don't have that, the crime of omission, for sure, they're going to fill in a criticism that then, you know, you'll have to come back and address anyway. So head that off at the pass. Mm -hmm. Bo, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with, with what you said. Um, I mean, of course, if you want to use equity, you have to explain, right? Don't assume everyone knows everything you said used in the equity. So it's it's you should explain that. Also, don't put too much too much stuff and too small figures into the proposal because oftentimes if I have to squeeze my eye, enlarge like a, you know ten times to look at something, and it's still so fuzzy, that doesn't even create a good impression on me when I try to decide who to assign those application to because you know. And you imagine the review who try to see your key figures, it just squeeze so small. Um, just be clear and, and think of yourself as, as the ones who actually read it and try to evaluate. Is that clear to you enough and crystal clear? And also some people put important information, not in the body of the application research plan, but in the vertebra animal section or other sections. And then that, that's not acceptable now. You have to put everything, key information into the body of the research proposal plan. Yeah, okay. I was involved in a grant with someone else who duplicated a figure from the research strategy into the vertebrate animal section. Mm -hmm. um, and their grant got administratively withdrawn because the, um, 
the question was they were putting extra stuff in the vertebral animal section yes. that was not present in the research strategy and ended up getting sorted out, but it was extremely stressful. So <laughs> I've told mm -hmm. everyone I know, don't put any figures in your vertebrate animal section. Just talk about breeding your mice and standard yes. procedures and stick to the facts. Don't try to put anything mm -hmm. extra. <laughs> and also Our the definitely. formatting issue yeah. is important because people try to pack too many uh, smaller font size that yeah. actually could get your brand withdrawn even before we go to review to send to it, review it is okay there to have smaller font size on the figure legends though right yeah but still it should be perfectly readable, readable. yeah what's the minimum for figure legend font size i, say, uh, I mean nine? Example, nine is a little small but uh ten nine yeah, yeah. But, you know i think nine is fine if it's a uh, clear but if you use a lot of subscript, subscript, and then getting complicated. <laughs> okay. I've seen those figure legend was like, oh my gosh, this long and it's so small. And then I really have a hard time to try to, because people ask me questions, why this one is so small font and how come it's not withdrawn? I'm like, let me take a look. And then, you know, I don't want to measure how many letters you're putting, how many square inch thing, but you can clearly tell this one's a violation of the font size and everything. So, mm -hmm. Anyway, try to avoid that because noise doesn't necessarily mean better. Right. That's like a hard lesson to learn, but reviewers actually like white space. Like it makes them feel calm and happy. Like <laughs> <laughs> spread out your paragraphs. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Instead of that it, concrete block in their face. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Okay, well, really good. I think we made it all the way through all the questions in the chat. Um, if I missed anything, if there are other questions that you have, I'm sure that Dr. SB and uh, um, Bo Hong would be happy to answer them. We're going to make all the slides available. Um, anything else we should say before we sign off here? Just thank you to all of our attendees. And on behalf of everyone at RRS, I'd like to thank Dr. SB, Dr. Schwartz, and Dr. Hong for your valuable time and expertise tonight. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. You're most welcome. It was a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much.